peoples, Will here from The Zipline Show. As you may notice, this isn't a podcast. We've actually started doing screencasts now to show off some of the stuff we've been talking about. So here I am at the Zipline Show. Dot com, our handy little website. Just need to drop the plug in there before I do anything else. This is our first screencast, so bear with us as we kind of get this whole thing put together. Today we're starting a five-part series on Python. That's right, you've heard us mention it, you've heard us mention its greatness, you've heard us talk about it, but now we figured that it's actually time for you to see it in action. Um, we have been talking a lot about stuff, but we actually want to start showing you things as well to move beyond the entertainment realm and get into the practical, hey, this is how you actually do cool stuff realm. Uh, today, part one is just going to be a little bit of an introduction to Python, talking about a few things, basically me babbling at you while this little flash animation goes crazy. Um, part two is going to be all about setting up Python in Windows, OS X, Mac, and Linux. So pretty much any platform, we're going to tell you how to get Python set up so you can actually start using it yourself. Part 3 is going to be a little introduction on the interpreter. That's the thing that turns your code into stuff the computer can actually understand and then runs it. So that's going to be a fun one. Part 4, uh, Ben is actually going to sit down and show you how to make a, little, a simple little program. And then part five is going to be running that program. Yes, it is important enough to break into two screencasts. Um, as always, we're always looking for help with stuff. I'm going to say always about six times in this sentence because we're always, 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 always looking for help with stuff. So if you like this Python screencast series and there's something you want us to cover, hop over to thezipline right here. This one there, it's highlighted so you can see it better and uh, drop us a note. We, we keep saying this, here's that actual contact us page. So, excuse the bad internet, it's very slow. You can just click that link and bam, there you go, fill out this handy little form and email us. Very simple to do, there's no excuse to not do it, so go over there and get on it. The number one biggest thing about Python is ease of use. Python is designed as a high-level language that really focuses on readability and clear syntax. If you've done any programming already, you know that some languages can get a little dense, we'll say. Uh, if you've ever had the honor, I guess is a word, of using Scheme, you know what it's like to just have so much junk going on in your code, you can't understand the logic of it. Python really strives to eliminate all that, just get it out of the way so that you can focus on the logic behind your programming and not have to worry about syntax or losing a parenthesis 5,000 characters into the document. Python is not into that. It is all about readability, clear syntax. Let me actually give you an example so you can see what I'm talking about. If you've never heard of the Fibonacci sequence, it's a math thing. Go look it up on your own. We don't cover that sort of thing here. Stupid Fibonacci sequence. This is an example from C++.com about how to do a Fibonacci sequence in C++. You can see that there's a lot of stuff going on here. And honestly, if you've never done C++, this probably looks super, super, super confusing. And I would not blame you if at this point you started crying and turned off your computer. Let's look at this in Python. Yeah, go over here. This is the same thing in Python. It still looks a little cryptic, but it's much easier to read. You can see there's some sort of def up here, which is just a function. And then you got a couple of variables. And then a single while loop, printing out stuff, going to the next one and then down here you call the function. So this is actually going up to the number 2000 in the Fibonacci sequence. So it's much, much cleaner in my opinion. C++ version, ugh, nasty and evil, blah, don't like. Versus Python version, so clean and fun and nice. You'll also notice there's a lot of indentation going on here. C++, a little bit, not so much. 
The main reason for this is that Python actually uses indentation to group together bits of code. So here in the C++ version, you can see all these squiggly brackets around, like there's one on line 8, another one on line 10, oops, like the whole thing, line 12 and line 18. Most languages use squiggly brackets to kind of group code together. Python uses indentation. So here we can see that things that are not indented at all are kind of the high level, uh, top of the line stuff. One indent groups things together and then two indent groups another things. So these two lines that have one, indent, one indentation before them are both at the same level. They will execute in sequence. Stuff that's indented further is all a member of the while loop. So two indents group this code into the while loop. Um, practically, this only has the benefit of making your code readable by force. Indentation is very nice in code. It helps, makes, helps things look nicer and easier to read. Indentation is not enforced in most languages. Python, it is. So that's kind of a, a little side benefit of Python. Just kind of goes towards making it clean and easy to use. Back to the python.org website. We're going to be visiting this again when we set things up. Um, just want to say that Python is really also designed to be super flexible. So you can do object-oriented programming, structured programming, functional programming. Python supports it all and doesn't care what you're doing. It is very much designed to take your particular style and desires and wants and, you know, programming habits into consideration while you're doing your thing. So however you program, Python can accommodate you. It's even got full C support, so you can tie in C code without much hassle, which in my opinion is really pretty neat. Um, it's just cool how much, how much mixing and matching Python allows. It's a very dynamic language. Uh, the second biggest advantage to Python, at least arguably, is the massive standard library running behind the scenes on this thing. Python is known for, is known for having a ton of pre-made tools that can do nearly anything you want. Out of the box, you can get uh, networking modules for your Python programming, cryptography, image manipulation, graphical user interface design modules. They're all pre-built, all set to go. You basically just need to say, hey, Python, use this particular module, and away you go. The, the library is huge. Uh, Randall Mon Monroe of XKCD fame pretty much said it best with this comic. I'll just, I'll just let you read it for a minute. <laughs> it's so funny. The joke here is that Python's standard library is so large they've already managed to get around to adding anti-gravity. So I just typed import anti-gravity. Python's standard library is so big, it's already got that built in. Which is cool, but also not far from the truth. Now here's the thing. There is one problem with Python right now. Um, this comes from the fact that there are currently two versions of Python. We mentioned this a bit in a recent podcast, but bears repeating. Right here, this line, new to Python or choosing between Python 2 and 3, read Python 2 or 3. The deal is, Python recently underwent a major version change from 2 to 3. By recently, I mean like two years ago now. But the problem is that Python 3 is not backwards compatible with Python 2. So you run into this issue where all the software that's been made with Python 2 does not work with Python 3. It's kind of a problem, especially when we take into account how big of a deal the standard library and all these packages and modules for Python are. A lot of these were written in Python 2, and now you just can't import them into Python 3 and expect them to work, because there are going to be incompatibilities there. So, Python kind of has that bit of an issue hanging over the head, its head right now. 
Um, they've done a lot to address it, though. Like, this big write-up was updated just in July 2010. That kind of brings you through the differences between uh, Python 2.7 and Python 3.1, the two most recent versions. And it really covers all of the concerns. So, which version should I use? Um, but when I want to avoid 2, 2x, it's the old language. Don't I want the new fancy one? This is really worth a read, especially if you're just getting into Python to kind of make that decision if you want to jump on the 3.0 bandwagon or stick with 2. Um, but basically the gist of it is, if you know you're going to be using a tool that only works with Python 2.7, then you have to use 2.7. If you're just getting into Python and aren't going to be using a lot of third-party tools, you might as well hop on 3.0 and use the newest stuff. Uh, the deal is Python 2.7 is pretty much an end-of-life release. There will be no more uh, upgrades to the version 2 of Python, and everything is going to be version 3. So eventually it's all going to get migrated to version 3. You might as well hop on board. With that said, we're going to be using the 2.7 version for this little screencast. Um, basically, Ben is super familiar with it. It's still got the most support, so if we get doing something really technical, we'll probably just want to have access to the, all those libraries I kind of mentioned. So we're going to be using 2.7. Fortunately, at the level we're going to be talking about, there are not many big differences between 2.7 and 3. Pretty much the print statement is the only one that's different. So don't, wor don't worry too much about us giving you horribly out-of-date examples. There probably will not be that many problems with it. So, I could talk all day about the technical greatness of Python. I could talk about its dynamic typing, its super support for web applications, uh, dynamic name resolution. But, honestly, these things don't matter. The easiest way to get you on the Python bandwagon is just to show it to you in action. So, let's hop over to part two of our series, Installing Python.